Hello everybody and welcome back to Nervous Reviews. Today we're doing a review in a public library that nobody is in. Meaning I can speak as loudly as I want and talk about whatever the heck I want and nobody will care. Today I wanted to discuss book two of Song of Ice and Fire, A Clash of Kings. A book that I've read quite a while ago but I haven't reviewed because I haven't had the time. However, I don't really have not have the time, I'm just lazy. So let's cut all this nonsense and get to it. First I'll start with the spoiler free review which will be a minute or two and then we'll move into the spoiler review. You will get warned when the spoiler begins so. As this review says, this book reeks of something that's called middle book syndrome and it is a very classic common thing in fantasy. For those that haven't read this book, I assume that maybe you've read the first book or maybe you heaven, you will probably know the praise that book one gets. A Game of Thrones is a fantastic, genuinely brilliant story and a genuinely brilliant book in and of itself. And people really, really say that this book on its own is fantastic, not to say anything of the greater series. And so that means that this would probably be, you know, the beginning of a trilogy. You know, that's just kind of how we think of things. On the other hand, you can kind of think as book three, which is A Storm of Swords, as also the end in the trilogy, even though it's not really, but this is kind of how people think about it. I haven't read the books, I can't confirm this. And so what really becomes apparent is that this book is more of a bridge novel in between these two major plot points rather than a novel in its own right. And you know that this is true because George R. R. Martin has many times mentioned that he intended for this series to originally be one book and then three books and then six books and then seven books. So these have ballooned out of control and the only logical explanation for this is that he began with something that was essentially three major books, three plot points, which you can assume is uh, maybe the first book, book three, and then book seven, which kind of makes sense. But in and of themselves, they were probably solid books. Even, you know, book three was probably a drooping middle in and of itself. I'm not exactly sure. However, so in book two of this series, we've essentially got nothing but the boring bits, which is the beginning bits of the middle book in the original trilogy. So what I'm saying is this book, how it was originally created in Martin's head, was intended to be the boring bit of the middle book. So that just makes it more of a middle book syndrome. So this is kind of what I would expect if you were definitely going to read this. Uh, if you've already read book one, you're probably going to read book two. Push through it. Uh, it's not that it's an awful book. It, in fact, it's a really awesome book. It is one of the best drooping middles that I've ever seen. But I will explain in the spoiler section why it is more of a drooping middle. So you can see that if you've already read the book, but if you haven't, you might just have to take my word for it. It is definitely a drooping middle. However, it is one of the best drooping middles I've ever read. It is a fantastic book with great characters that continue on. The world building stage strong. It, it's a really beautiful prose. It continues to be an incredible work of actual fantasy, like of, of a fantasy genre in particular. It, it takes everything that we have in fantasy and really ratchets it up to a really gorgeous, fresh new angle. And it, it stays as strong, at, it at least is as bad as book one was bad. So it's definitely not too much worse than book one. That needs to be said, but it definitely does not reach the heights of book one with all of these beautiful new stories and these new characters and these interesting angles and all of these treacheries and all these secrets. That is all gone from this, essentially. All we have is not not necessarily the fallout, but the build up to the next book and some of the fallout from the previous book. And so you're left in a very middle, middle area where not every single character is involved in the same great epic final battle, right? Whatever that is not every character is involved in it and so it just ends up being a drooping middle. So now I'm moving on to the spoiler section. I'm really, really proud of my Goodreads review for this book. I'm really proud of it. I think it explained everything really well and if you just want to read it, you should go read that on my Goodreads. Linked in the description. But to put it simply, this book, like I said before, has a drooping middle and the reason being any major climax that has been reached by any of the characters was reached in a Game of Thrones. Things like the leaving of Jon Snow to the wall and his escape from the wall. These are really fascinating, interesting ideas and uh, it really does delve deep into the character of Jon Snow. And it's fantastic. The death of Eddard Stark. Beautiful, great, fantastic moment from uh, the reaction from the rest of the Stark family. That's um, unbelievably fascinating. The immediate power plays by the Lannisters. Fantastic. Just really, really interesting stories. And these things are all encapsulated by the first book. We know all that. In book two, as you all know, nothing like this happens. There are very few fantastic plot points as there were in book one. And you can kind of just think about that for a second, right? The best plot point that we've gotten was Stannis, who was, don't get me wrong, fantastic character, fantastic introduction. However, it does not make up for the 10 fantastic introductions we had in the first book. So while Stannis was without a doubt awesome, and then his brother, who I've forgotten the name of, is also a fantastic introduction, just great, great introduction. We also get um, Theon, his own point of view chapters, as well as who, and, and his death and his entire story was fascinating. Like the way that we kind of pulled away from the major story in order to tackle Theon's story, fantastic, I love that. It is such a, such. that is the kind of thing that I mean when I say it does not reach 
the height of book one because that reached the height of book one. Theon reaches, or at least attempts to reach, the height of book one. He is a fresh story going off, doing his own thing in, in a way that is so beautifully started in this story. It's a great start. However, you know, it doesn't end. It doesn't keep going since he's dead, as far as I can tell. And so that just means that this story, you know, Theon just cannot reach the heights of someone like Jon Snow, who we know his story is just beginning, but the beginning introduction is just so fantastic. It kind of ends with that, and while it was great, and you know, it was, it was very solid, it doesn't keep going, and that takes away from it. Another really great beginning story would have to be, without a doubt, Davos. Davos is a fantastic character, um, and we get only a couple of chapters from Davos, which is surprising because he's a fantastic character, but also kind of makes sense because Davos was also the most difficult and most frustrating character to read, and the reason for that is simple. Davos goes through an adventure that is so far removed from everyone else, but is so fascinating. So the seafaring adventures, and, and you know all about the attacks that Davos has. And so I can say, and I'm sure that you understand, that Davos's chapters were written so much more densely than anybody else's. And I, I, I assume that you guys can understand it. It's very, like, it's a very strong story, it's a fantastic story. I just couldn't understand half of it. I had to reread it multiple times in order to just understand the gist of what they were saying. Most of these chapters, like, you know, like Cersei or um, Theon or Caitlin, I can just read them and I don't have to think too hard, right? It's not a, it's not a focused procedure to understand the, the chapter. However, with Davos, it is a focused precision-based reading experience because you have to understand every nuance of the situation or it doesn't make sense a page later. It really does build on everything and it's just so out of the blue. It's so odd compared to everything else we've read. So what I mean to say with these two character introductions is just that it's fine, right? These are very strong characters, but they simply do not have as many of the new character introductions as we did in the previous book. And that's not, you know, you can't really blame him for that. It's not like you can add another 10 characters, but it is what it is, right? You have to take account for the fact that the character introductions were fantastic and the beginnings of so many fantastic stories were just really interesting. You do not get that with Theon. It does, it's not even a beginning. It is just a story that begins and is very promising and was really, really engaging, but then died out. And then also Davos, who, you know, it, it wasn't as interesting, but you know it's going to keep going and you know it's going to continue to be fascinating and interesting. But it, it's just not enough. It's not enough compared to book one. And then you can go on to the more standard characters. This is clearly a Tyrion book. You all know this is a Tyrion book. The entire book sets up Tyrion's final conquest, basically. And it is fascinating. Tyrion is great. And the chapters, while, while they aren't event-filled, they're remarkably good. And, and this just speaks to the quality of Martin's writing. It is a fantastically interesting story, even though not that much happens. A lot of small things happen. He just makes it seem so grand and interesting, even though objectively not that much stuff happens. And this is kind of where it contrasts with book one. While in book one, the writing was still there. It was just still a fantastically written prose. It lacks the scale or the interesting complicatedness or the um, beautiful interwoven web of this new world that you're exploring. It lacks that in book two, What where, where it actually has that in book one. And so Tyrion... I, it's not a bad chapter. It, it is a great chapter. It is just not as good as the best chapters in book one. And I was very satisfied with Tyrion. I thought that his arc was fantastic. It was very, very interesting. The world is continuously interesting. The siege was interesting and pushed the story forward. The Tyrion like invasion, I forget what you call it. It was, it was an attack, a defense, something like that. It doesn't really affect many of the other characters. For example, um, Arya. It doesn't affect Arya that much. It doesn't affect Jon Snow that much. There are a bunch of characters. Caitlyn, not so much as Caitlyn. It really doesn't affect Caitlyn too much. And you have all these main characters that are not taking part in the major event of the story. And that's kind of a problem, don't you think? Because you kind of have a final great event that doesn't impact maybe half the characters. And that's really odd. Like Daenerys doesn't get impacted by this. That's, that's just such a baffling thing to have. Why doesn't Daenerys or Jon have any impact in this story? And I, I can't really blame it because I'm sure that this will work out better for the story in general in the end, but it does take away from this book because this book doesn't have that yet, doesn't have the payoff for that yet. Jon Snow was boring. Um, I really was not a fan of Jon Snow. I felt that where the story that he was going was almost directionless. It didn't make much sense. It was comparatively very boring. Um, the exploration was mostly nothing. Um, it was just a lot of talking with his friends, and it was a little bit of interesting exploration, like the 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 first men and stuff like that. Were, were fascinating stories. Uh, don't get me wrong, but there was just too many chapters of Jon Snow for me to uh, for these to be filled with everything interesting. Same thing happened with Arya. Arya once in a while had an interesting story going for her, um, but I just could not care until until basically she got caught and she got sent to that one camp. That was after that point. I, I completely didn't care. Um, this this idea of that you got three kills, something like that. That was a viciously boring story, and I can't imagine why it even happened. It, it doesn't seem obvious to me what that meant, because Arya, it feels like a complete side quest that has nothing to do with the story.
And of course, I've been spoiled for book three a little bit. And so I do know that this story is going to end up somewhere, but it hasn't gotten there yet. And so because of that, I have to take away points because it hasn't gotten there yet. And the entire Arya plot in the story feels out of the blue. Sansa felt pretty good. Uh, while she didn't do much, she was so close to witnessing everything that was going on. And it was such a fresh take on the stories being told by the Lannisters. So I was totally willing to forgive that because there weren't too many Sansa stories and they were like reasonably interesting altogether. I didn't have a huge problem with them, but again, it, it's not even close to reaching the heights of the average uh, Game of Thrones story. Caitlyn is remarkably sidelined. I, I could not believe how much she was sidelined. It, it, it's like as if George R. R. Martin does not care about this character whatsoever. Like he's gonna, in, like if I were to bet, she's probably gonna die in like the next book because I don't know, right? Like why, why would you sideline her this much? And then how, how could you get her back into the story? It doesn't make so much sense to me. Daenerys, uh, when I wrote the review on Goodreads, I did write the Daenerys plot feels like George R. R. Martin's attempt to create the illusion of world building without doing the specific work of world building. I, I now know that that's false after reading Fire and Blood, so forgive me for that one. However, I do have to mention that it didn't feel like it was world building. It felt like it was a bunch of random nonsense that was going on in the world that I didn't care enough about because it felt like he was, she was moving from city to city to city to city, doing all these random different traditions, meeting different people. I couldn't even tell if she was in the same city or in different cities. It didn't make much sense to me. And at the end of the day, after all of this work that she did, what did she get? You know, she, she was in there for maybe like eight chapters. And that's my guess, maybe five to eight chapters. And at the end of the day, she accomplished something that she could have probably accomplished in like the first chapter, right? It, like it's not, it was, it was an entirely luck-based story and it was just going clearly nowhere from what I could tell. Um, the story probably would have been much more isolated if she had just stuck to like one specific city near Westeros and just done that there. So it, it is a little bit frustrating for me to say this, but Daenerys was definitely the weak point in this book. My guess is there's probably more characters. I can't even remember if Cersei was a main character. She might have been. I have no idea. If she was, she was uh, boring compared to Tyrion. Like that's kind of straightforward. There must have been more, but for whatever reason, I can't even begin to remember. Oh, there was Rob. I believe. Rob, oh, I completely forgot about Rob. Even in the review, I believe Rob was such a lame story. And I know that theoretically, Rob is doing the main character story. He's effectively supposed to be the main character in this broader plot, other than Tyrion. And so I, he should have cared more, but I also didn't care about Rob in the previous book. So it kind of continues going in the same direction. Rob was doing stuff that was in theory interesting, but in writing was not interesting. It didn't actually create any interesting pages or interesting chapters. So that is kind of the unfortunate thing. And I had to go through all these characters because it's a, this, this book is where you officially get to multiple stories. You get to like each character is their own story and they all diverge and they have nothing to do with each other. And Arya doesn't influence Rob, Rob does not influence John, John does not influence Daenerys. You have all these things going on and it just ends up being what I believe is an unraveling of stories. And this is the beginning of the unraveling of stories. So you started with all these characters together and it was fascinating, right? Like all of these great, interesting character interactions, fascinating uh, world that they're all involved in. And then they leave. Okay, that's this book. They're leaving. Nothing really that much interesting happens. A couple fights and squabbles, but nothing more than that. I'm hoping we get to the point where they leave and they finally get to their own major strong plot where they're independently able to carry their own story. That's what I'm hoping the next book is. And that's what I hear the next book is. So I'm hoping that that's how it keeps going. And I'm very excited to read the third book. And I think that all in all, this is effectively middle book syndrome. This feels like a classic middle book syndrome where the characters feel like they began on a great note and then they're not at the quite at the interesting part of the stories yet. And so I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for watching this video. And if you enjoyed this review, please hit a like down button down below and comment what you think about my review. I would love to hear your thoughts on what you thought of Clash of the Kings. If you thought that I was being too harsh on it, it maybe doesn't feel as much as middle book syndrome or whatever you want to say. My previous review must have been the uh, Red Seas Under Red Skies Gentleman Bastards review. You can check that out if you want. And please let me know how you like the style of spoiler-free and then spoiler review. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.